I want to thank everyone for coming today. We have a great group of people that we put together at this table. Re recognizing that when you're putting together solutions to help those most in need, there are so many access points, and lack of access tends to be one of the major issues. Lack of access to transportation, lack of access to retail, to jobs, to education, to health care. So we have put together a phenomenal table today. I think a number of you have already been introduced. Um, a phenomenal table today that really wants to share the insights, and we're here to listen to what the city of Fort Worth, what your needs are, and how we can help partner. Um, it's a tremendous honor to have you, Secretary Carson, here to represent HUD and to represent the country. And without further ado, um, let's go ahead and, and, and hear some of your thoughts. Should we, uh, should we have everybody go around and introduce um, themselves? We can, we can do that. We just, uh, we are, uh, I, unfortunately, we are short on time. We're talking short <laughs> introductions. So Beth Van Dyne, uh, Regional Administrator for HUD. Hello, I'm Sherry Breed, and I'm the Chief of Equity and Excellence in Fort Worth ISD, representing Dr. Strickland. Fernando Costa, Assistant City Manager, City of Fort Worth. Gina Bivens, City Council District 5 and President of North Texas Leaders, which is an employment diversity initiative. D. Jennings, President of the Black Chamber, straight out of Butler. <laughs> <laughs> Franklin Moss, former City Council person, and also I represent my church, Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church. I'm John Robinson with the Eamon Carter Foundation. Sharvey Charles, a resident of Calvo Apartments. Fred Slaybach, President of Texas Wesleyan University. I'm Robert Early. I'm President and CEO of JPS, the public hospital here in Tarrant County. And Gene Giovanni, Chancellor of Tarrant County College. I'm Lily Biggins, uh, recently retired President of Texas Health Care Medical School Earth Hospital, which is the largest hospital in the community. Hi, Leah King, Chief Operating Officer for United Way. Patrick Winfield, the Potter's House of Fort Worth, campus pastor. Michael Morris, uh, Staff Director uh, for the Metropolitan Planning Organization in the Fort Worth, Dallas region. Brigitte Henry from Calhoun, a resident. Tiffany Williams from Fort Worth Housing and also President of the Residential Association. Mary Margaret Lemons, President of Fort Worth Housing Solutions. Well, I tell you, uh, it's so delightful to see so many people representing so many different aspects uh, of our society coming together. You know, really for the purpose of, of empowering people and uh, fitting under those four different uh, pillars, uh, economic, educational, health and wellness, as well as character development and leadership development. Uh, and everybody that I just heard fits into one of those particular categories. And what we're really interested in is uh, every single Envision Center is unique and really responds to the community in which it exists and what is needed there and how the various entities can work together. Uh, it is true that the federal government will bring a lot of resources in that. You know, there are many programs at HUD, many programs at Department of Labor, Department of Education, et cetera, et cetera, and, and they've all agreed to, to help but uh, we really want to hear from you in terms of, of your vision uh, for how it should work here. Each one of you could probably spend a week <laughs> educating and helping us, and we unfortunately have a, a short period of time. Um, uh, Chancellor Giovannini, I know that we had met several um, months ago and talked about some of the training programs and opportunities that we could partner with. Do you want to talk about that at all? Sure. Um, the, the college has, has a good relationship, certainly, with the city and the entire county as it relates to workforce training, but specifically to be intentful and purposeful and to interject program services in communities which will um, uh, you know, ass assist folks. And you talk about ways in which to, to do things differently as opposed to the past. For example, the biggest tr hurdles our students have are transportation and, and child care. So just last month we began providing bus services transportation for all of our students. We're now on the, the, uh, on the cusp of, of doing like uh, activity in the child care arena. So what we're trying to do is be intentful and purposeful in taking down the barriers to directly provide programs and services to students, whether it's going there to them or for students to come to us. And Gina mentioned a little bit about the new collar economy, new collar jobs. And, 
in a large part, a lot of what we've traditionally done, a lot of what's been traditionally um, supported through traditional degree programs and credit programs and certificate programs are fine. Nevertheless, though, there are other opportunities today that put people directly to work in short-term training, which needs to be supported and needs to be held accountable for, being that it's a measure of success so that the institutions have the, uh, the incentive, if you will, to develop such programs and provide people with real I've skilled training for the jobs that are available today that may not be a traditional degree program or certificate program. So we are positioned well to be able to address those barriers as well as to provide the new programs and services in a manner in which put people to work more quickly or move them on the path for further education. Okay. Talking about transportation, Michael Morris, you want to jump in? Well, Regional Administrator, thank you for your service and, and Dr. Carson, welcome. Uh, three things come to mind, and I'll say them very quickly. Um, as a result of work by former Representative Kerry, who you met, and uh, Representative Lewis, who is here, we built Rosedale as a project that wasn't built for transportation purposes, but to change the fabric of Stop 6 to create an environment of hope in that particular uh, community. We are now partnering with the Housing Authority as they transition residents back into neighborhood they're sitting on some pretty valuable land. It could be more valuable if those of us in transportation increase the accessibility to the land. So when that land gets sold, that value capture can be kept by the housing authority as a revenue source to build more housing in Fort Worth. Uh, and lastly, my board at the Metropolitan Planning Organization is frustrated that social workers have, to have a Sophie's choice of do I give this transit pass for someone to go to the doctor or do I give this transit pass for someone to go to the community college to get to class? And pledged a million dollars towards eliminating this gap. And uh, I think your vision is a terrific vision for metropolitan planning organizations across this country to be partners with you in creating public-private partnerships as, you, as you're exactly. uh, suggesting. So it's not a one and done situation. It's a legacy we're giving in some rotating revenue scheme where community colleges, why do they have to pay for the transportation of their kids? We should be providing those resources to them. So use the term, Dr. Carson, holistic right. solutions. You're seeing a holistic group. In Fort Worth, we call it silo busting. We wish to tear down some of these artificial barriers to create horizontal partnerships to deliver that message that you're trying to deliver. Exactly. And the nice, the nice thing is, you know, as we empower people, uh, as they become contributors, uh, the, the economic uh, viability of the whole community increases very substantially. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um. Dr. Carson, the, uh, <coughs> some of the things that have happened in Fort Worth up to now have been very successful because of public-private partnerships. And one of the things that I mentioned to Beth when she took over was if there's ways to leverage HUD dollars, when, it, when, when there's local dollars in play, I think there's more success because there's a local accountability right. and uh, there's a local buy-in. So I, I hope there's ways to incentivize even larger participation when, there's a, when the local community is stepping into, not, not just the city, but the private, private funds. Yeah, well, you know, I was uh, delighted to hear that there's a commitment now to uh, convert all the public housing through the RAD program. Uh, seeing what that has done around the country has been extremely impressive. And uh, of course, uh, now we have the opportunity zones. And uh, several areas here in Texas are going to be included in the opportunity zones. When you combine the opportunity zones with the RAD program, uh, with LIHTC, with uh, new market tax credits, uh, with Section 108 uh, guarantees, I mean, this is this is like the key time to get things done, and now that we're reorienting the Section Three program also, so that we get the local people involved in training and and employment opportunities, uh, this will be an excellent opportunity for people to begin to escape uh, from. And and you know, I don't I don't like to uh, to criticize anything that's been done before. I'll just say it's been neglected in the past by a whole host of people over many decades. 
by concentrating on programs as opposed to concentrating on people. If we focus on the people themselves and what they need, and, and, and that's really what this is all about. Because what I've discovered in traveling around this country is that Americans tend to actually be pretty nice people. They actually want to help people. You wouldn't think that, you know, by uh, watching television. You would think we all hate each other and want to cut each other's throats. But the fact of the matter is we, we have a lot of goodwill and a lot of resources. And if we start concentrating on that and telling those stories and getting people involved, it's actually fun to help people. It's actually fun to see the progress that occurs. To, you know, to, the, the greatest thing for me uh, as, a, as a pediatric neurosurgeon, it, it wasn't necessarily the, the big complex cases that got a lot of international attention. It's being able to see somebody whose life was a mess and through the grace of God, you know, now they're living a health, healthy life. I still see that today. Every place I go, I run into former patients. They're grown up now. They may have their own kids. But what a wonderful thing it is to just be privileged to participate and seeing another human being realize their potential. And again, as I, as I talked about out there, what will actually allow our country to succeed? It's our people. And when I was growing up, uh, and I, I remember I spent all my afternoons uh, with one of my aunts when we lived in Boston. Uh, they lived in public housing. It was a pretty violent uh, area. But you know, one of the things that I'll never forget is that there were a whole lot of people that were really smart. <laughs> I mean, they were, they were smarter than me. They were really smart people. But their, their lives never went anywhere. And uh, those, I'm thinking, there's still a, a lot of awfully smart people, a tremendous amount of talent. And, uh, you know, one of the things that happened a few weeks ago was uh, Dean Kamen, the guy who invented the Segway and a whole bunch of things, and now has a program across the country with robotics in high schools. And I'm talking to him about, you know, bringing these robotic uh, programs to Envision Centers. Because think about all these young kids who probably have untold intellectual ability. They just have never had an opportunity to express it. Who's, who is going to you know, be advantaged by developing that? We are. All of us. We have people out there who could discover a new energy source. Uh, we just have to give them the tools to do it. Dr. Carson, I, I have a question for you. Is, is my mic on? Uh, we are blessed in Stop 6 in Fort Worth to have retired HUD Regional Administrator Don Babers. He's in the room with us right now. But everyone doesn't have that kind of secret weapon. When I hear Dr. Giovannini talk about paying for transportation for his students, and then I hear Mike saying, well, we could help with that, there is a need for communication getting out. Now, you, it would take 50 years to build a website that would tell everything that could be you know, found and where to get it. But if, if there is an effort to have a, a sole source of information just based on FAQs, it might be helpful. Uh, you have the home administration, the uh, home, homeowners associations, neighborhood associations, but some people are members of nothing. Mm -hmm. And so just being able to make sure that you touch every vehicle possible in terms of communication would be very helpful because people around this table are quite educated. Mm -hmm. We don't know where a lot of stuff is. Right. And so I think that's going to fall in your lap and Fort Worth is willing to help, mm -hmm. but there is a need for that, I can assure you. Absolutely, and we're going to do that. And uh, we're developing an app uh, that will be specific for each area that incorporates all that. We're, we're actually pretty far along with that, and then we had to stop. Uh, believe it or not, uh, certain people in Congress say, well, you can't do that. You don't have authority to do that, you know. So, you know, we got to fight through all of that. But, you know, that's, that's why they call it the swamp. But anyway, <laughs> you know, we're, we're getting through all of that, and we'll have specific apps for each place. You'll be able to go into that app, find out a lot of stuff, even if you live in a rural area. Uh, because, you know, it's not just about the cities. It's about all of our country. And uh, we need to empower everybody. Dr. Carson, uh, part of your platform include economic development. Would, we s would you discuss that a little bit? Well, you know, 
the opportunities uh, that people have for jobs. That's, that's the killer. And uh, right now, there are more jobs available than there are people uh, who are looking for them. But that doesn't mean that we've solved the, the job problem. It simply means that there are a lot of people who've dropped out of the system. They're not looking for a job anymore. The labor force participation rate is up to 67%, which is a, a 4% jump that we're ahead been. And we need to get that up <laughs> into the 90s, you know, people who who are capable of working, who are work able, uh, getting them jobs. And I'm talking about good paying jobs. And people have forgotten that a lot of skilled jobs pay a lot of money. And when we're talking about economic development, uh, not only Section 3, but Job Corps and a lot of other uh, entities are willing to provide training. A lot of these training spots are empty. There's nobody coming into them. I don't, I don't know why that is, but that's something we're going to figure out so that we can get people into those training spots. I had one CEO tell me recently, he said, I wish I could find a welder. Give me a welder. He can be right out of school. I'll pay him $80,000 a year. Uh, you know, this is going on all over the country. And uh, so these are the kinds of things that we're talking about when we're talking about economic empowerment. Also, you know, college, but a lot of people don't know about the various careers. You know, if you, you ask a lot of the kids in uh, underprivileged areas, what do you want to do when you grow up? And frequently you get a blank stare, uh, maybe a basketball player, you know. But, you know, the fact of the matter is there is so much. I mean, there's thousands. I mean, literally thousands of jobs that they don't know anything about. And that's another thing that we want to bring into the Envision Center is the opportunity to learn not only what those jobs are, but what do you have to do to get there. And, you know, we don't want to just tantalize people with possibilities. We want to actually help them to be able to get there. That's, that's part of what everybody here is doing. Lily Biggins, I see your hand up. I wanted to just share a couple of comments uh, with Dr. Carson. Thank you for being here. I'm a big proponent of neurosurgery care, and also I've studied you all my life. <laughs> um, the reality is that as we create these centers, we have to, there are certain things that I think we have to be careful of, and that is, is that we don't create these pockets of poverty, uh, and that we bring those resources, and as I've read a report, it seems that the plan is to bring the resources to the individuals. I grew up in this area, grew up in the project, uh, and um, my first job was a housekeeper. And I went on to become the president of the largest hospital. So I know that there's a lot of brain power in these pockets. Mm -hmm. But we have to make sure that we're, we're fleshing that out in a way that people feel valued. And I appreciate your Christian uh, faith and the way you're elevating our Lord and Savior Jesus Amen. Christ and the work that you do. But what we have to do is we have to look at these young kids who have created a, a crime. They've, they've, they've committed a crime. And they did it when they were 17 or 18. And now they can't get housing because they have to check the box. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't get a job because there's a box there as well. And so as we create these processes for people to develop sustainability, and elevate their whole life and their kids' lives. Those are some of the things that we have to consider. Absolutely. So thank you for looking at that. I think we have an opportunity to change the entire recidivism rate in, in the state of Texas. It's, it's shameful. Yes. But at the end of the day, if we will allow these kids to get jobs and pull them into an employment system, they can do better. Mm -hmm. I know that there's talent in those projects. Absolutely. And I know that this model can work in this community because we have consortiums that mm -hmm. approve from that. And please continue to bring that up because I don't, I don't, I don't want that to get lost in the shuffle. And we're working on that. Uh, uh, actually, Jared Kushner is, uh, is uh, chairing the committee. We brought many people from different disciplines in, recognizing that there's an enormous amount of talent in our penal system. And, uh, you know, we have to work on that from two perspectives. One perspective is how do we keep people from going in there in the first place? And the second perspective is once they get in there, uh, you know, how do we rehabilitate? You know, what, what we've got right now is a system that 
just trains people to be better criminals when they <laughs> go in there. And we really have to change that paradigm quickly because it's not helpful to our country. And I would say the funding for the workforce systems throughout the country so they can continue to have those programs that elevate these kids when they come out. And it's not only kids, but that's been my heart and it's been my interest for many years. Yeah. Dr. Carson, Dr. Carson uh, the city of Fort Worth is a ban-the-box city. Didn't mean to cut whoever that was off. We are a ban-the-box city, the city of Fort Worth, but we have not penetrated that to the major employers in the area. After this meeting, I'll take it upon myself to educate them on ban-the-box because there is an opportunity for people to be employed if you just remove that criminality question from the job application. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Dr. Carson, I would... I would tell you that I think one of the things for the Envision Center is that we hear your words after you leave. Yeah. Because everybody at this table will want to thank you and want to thank Beth for putting this together and all your hard work and, and thank Mary Margaret for all your efforts. But the key is from a public health standpoint and what we're doing at a public hospital and what Lily did at Texas Health Resources, if we fix somebody's health but after they leave that hospital soon after they go to a prison or they go back to spousal abuse, mm -hmm. or they go back to a situation where they can't balance a checkbook, or even worse, they don't have a checkbook, your health is always going to be yeah. secondary, third, and fourth on that level. Right. So if we can keep a holistic 360 approach, and this could well be the nucleus to do that, not only do I applaud you, I thank you, and Beth, I thank you, because your words and your efforts are what needs to last so much longer and we need to hear that continuously to keep this center what it is because if we only take care of somebody's health but we return them as you said earlier mm -hmm. to an environment that is tough right. and and bad we'll keep that cycle keep going and that cycle needs to reverse itself through education through housing through transportation and through better wellness so right. i applaud you and i thank uh, you well thank you and you bring up something that's very important uh, one of the reasons that a lot of government programs fail is because you have people from Washington who come down and make proclamations <laughs> and then they go back to Washington and <laughs> that's kind of the end of it. Um, and, and the reason I believe that these envision centers are going to work very well is because you all are on the ground floor as this thing is being built and you're not going anywhere. <laughs> you're going to be here. And uh, you know, we're going to be there to support uh, and bring resources, but you know the the real intellect is going to come from the people who are here, who do care, and this provides a mechanism for the manifestation of that caring. Okay. Carson, one thing that I would ask is, one, we run into this very frequently, especially around training people from um, either they're leaving a, a, a previous career and they're seeking uh, employment opportunities in other areas, and when they're being trained. The resources, especially sometimes federal or state, um, what they're allowed to be trained on is not what the employer needs. They're not keeping pace with current technology and, and the needs of the employers. And it's one lack, perhaps, around this table is to have the business um, community represented so that they can better participate in development of that curriculum. So as you're training people, mm -hmm. it's relevant to what we need, not just today, yeah. but really what doesn't exist today. Thank you for bringing that up because that's one of the reasons that I said each Envision Center will be unique uh, because it's going to be designed to respond to the needs of that particular area at that time. Dr. Carson, uh, once again, thank you so much for doing this. A couple of things that's, that's very important, especially in the area of education, and that's the reason why I believe the housing component is very important. In talking with many of our principals in our community, one of the things that they allude to uh, that is a pervasive problem for student achievement is the issue of transient families uh, because students don't stay in a particular school system or a school for uh, longer than what they, uh, they need to uh, based on housing, based on uh, opportunities that are out there. So the employment situation is very important, certainly to our families. Uh, but the idea of holistic education, because I, I believe in holistic education too, I'm a uh, before I was a pastor, I was an educator. Uh, uh, being able to educate a family prenatal and to be able to take care of a family prenatal, to give them opportunities and resources prenatal, is something that is very important to the academic and intellectual and psychological and relational uh, development of every child, of every family. My question is, 
is within the context of that, well, actually two questions. First question is, uh, we also know that the number one place where African Americans and Hispanics will come to uh, when they are looking for information or looking for resources is the church. And so my first question is, how does Envision or the Envision Centers plan to partner with the church uh, to make sure that we're able to to disseminate resources and the information to know where the inf uh, what resources are so that families can get them. And then my second question is, oftentimes when programs happen uh, within our communities uh, that are instituted by one administration, uh, sometimes seemingly the funding for that kind of uh, disappears when the administration changes. Mm -hmm. So over a period of time, over a long period of time, can you also speak to the sustainability of Envision Centers in our communities? Yeah, well, of course, that's, that's the reason that we want these established at the local level by the people who will be Democrats, Republicans, Independents, uh, every stripe, uh, because there isn't anything about this that is partisan in nature, and we want to keep it that way uh, in, in terms of the sustainability. As far as the church is concerned, um, you know, the kind of work that we're talking about here used to be done by the churches. Yeah. And, s and then the government came in and said, we'll take over. Well, the fine mess they made out of it. Uh, <laughs> 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 but, uh, you know, really, I, I think it's a matter, the churches are very welcome in this program, believe me, the faith-based community, because that's where a lot of our values come from. That's where a lot of the principles come from. That's where the love your neighbor comes from, um, you know, not pushing any particular denomination or faith, but I would much rather be dealing with somebody who has faith than somebody who doesn't, just in terms of the way they treat people and, a ter and the way they should treat people. Um, so the Envision Centers will obviously uh, be coordinating with the churches in the area, particularly in terms of the various programs that the churches offer. One of the things that uh, I've, I've been pushing and we're going to keep working on it is actually projects for churches. You know, like a church might adopt a block and say, our responsibility is to do lead remediation in this block. You know, a lot of times when people have a specific project, they can do it very well. They concentrate their efforts on it. But those, those are s some of the kinds of projects. But a, l a lot of churches also offer child care, um, which, again, will empower that young woman. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times we want to blame these young women. We say, what are you going to do, having all these babies and stuff? But the fact of the matter is our program encourages them to do that. Um, so, you know, we have to take some responsibility. And when I say we, I'm talking about the government. And I if we created this situation, we really should take some responsibility in fixing it. Uh, Dr. Carson, I appreciate this opportunity to be with you and share some ideas. Uh, one, of the, one of the two areas that I wanted to express some concerns about is that one of the things that we're doing is relates to persons on subsidized housing. We're concentrating them. Uh, and in that concentrating process, we eliminate the role models from a mixed income neighborhood and, and that's kind of a question, are we going to be doing more of that in pooling resources, not only in dealing with the soft programs, but the hard things like housing, uh, because that is one of the issues that we're, we're confronted with here in Fort Worth. And I think the other thing that this community has uh, benefited from what we call an opportunity center that actually train people for jobs that are already in place. The real problem is when we start dealing with uh, subsidi persons in subsidized housing, they don't meet the minimum skills in order to get into the training where they can earn $35 an hour. So that, that is one of the uh, problems that we have and will the Envision Centers lend itself to working with some of those issues? I bet Beth wants to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> do you want yeah. Mary yeah I, I'm, actually, I'm happy to jump in actually I, I do want to mention 
this is what we see the Envision Center as, as a continuation of what we've been doing on a, we're gonna be able to do on a larger scale. So currently, Fort Worth Housing Solution already partners with Tarrant County College to offer on-site soft skills training for interviews, resumes, things like that, as well as GED classes, both at both of our public housing, large public housing uh, properties. So Cavill and Butler have on-site GED classes, and we'll, we have daycare on-site as well to make sure that people, you know, have every opportunity to be in those classes. So we expect to be able to add to the, the programs that we offer. And what we do currently is we pay TCC for the professor, and so our residents don't pay anything for those classes. They're able to come in and complete not only GED, but stackable certifications like um, CNA, so nursing, um, phlebotomy, things like that, to be able to get those higher paying jobs and stack those certifications. So we just expect to expand the, the partnerships we already have throughout the city, both with Fort Worth ISD and our universities um, for those educational opportunities. And as far as um, high concentrations of low income housing, our RAD uh, program is actually deconcentrating. We're spreading out and doing mixed income properties um, all over the city. So we are aware of that and working towards trying to address it. And we're trying to work with the local levels as much as possible, understanding that DC is not gonna tell Fort Worth what to do, nor should it, but listening directly from the residents, directly from the community leaders, and seeing where we can fill those, those holes, um, and how we can actually strengthen the relationships that the community has already built. I mean, with the, with the hospital systems, with the transportation systems, with the um, philanthropic societies, and how we can, through all of the different departments within the federal government, make it a lot easier to work and make it a lot more efficient. But this, the, the other real issue, though, is those hard dollars that are coming down mm -hmm. uh, from Washington into this community. How do we start shaping those so that we're not just necessarily working with HUD pro pro programs, but all of the other I departments uh, within, uh, within government uh, to pull those sources together so that you get a, a, a combined uh, uh, output versus uh, just HUD dealing with, uh, with an issue Burst and but it impacts uh, a lot of the other programs. Well, you know that's that's something that we have been working on uh, breaking down those silos, and and being able to really get synergy uh, between our departments. So, uh, for instance, week before last, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with uh, Secretary Acosta on labor, in, in terms of the many resources uh, that they have for job training, which are not being adequately utilized, which I think uh, through Envision Centers, we can really take advantage of those uh, types of programs. So, uh, you know, you've touched upon something that is critical, and that is, you know, finding a way that we can uh, gain synergy by working together, looking at how those dollars are spent together. Those are all things that, that we've been spending a lot of time working on. It's a critical issue. Dr. Carson, I'll brag on Dr. Giovannini. He hasn't mentioned this, but if anybody you know around the country needs welders, he's producing welders <laughs> at the Opportunity <laughs> Center. I, I can't attend all the graduation classes that they do convene, and so hats off to you on that. Uh, that Opportunity Center is also the place where victims from Hurricane Katrina learn how to drywall. The key, again, becomes communication making sure people are aware of those services that are available. But I can tell you that the Opportunity Center in Stop 6 Texas, which is where you are, is always running and gunning. And people are working, they're able to pay rent, buy houses because of the work done at that community college. And it's, it's very, very clear that it serves our community from the legacy of Irma Johnson Hadley, your deceased predecessor, Robert's former board chair. She wanted people to know that this college, this district, this agency will help you get a job. And so just hats off. And if you pay relocation fees, I'm sure he can send you a few. And I also want to make sure that we're hearing, I also want to make sure that we're hearing from the actual, uh, the, the Fort Worth ISD. I know you've had your hand up yeah. a little bit. Yes, I'm sorry. First of all, let me add my welcome, and we're glad you're here and the opportunity to have the face-to-face -face conversation with you. Uh, I wanted to just point, as I listened to you speak in the other room, I thought about the um, myriad of uh, opportunities this is going to provide for our students that are right there in the Cabell so, uh, area and uh, surrounding areas as well. So I just wanted to say, I know you're, um, some of you know some of the individuals that I work with that are from the district or our liaisons with the community. We want to extend on behalf of Fort Worth ISD. I don't know other ways we might be able to support and be a part, but I know Dr. Scribner would want 
you all to know that we are here and we stand ready to continue that uh, that uh, partnership and be whatever we can do to assist. Right. This is a wonderful Thank opportunity. You. And I was delighted to hear that there's some uh, resident groups represented yes. here. Uh, because I, I've found that as I travel around the country, the, the places that do the best are the ones that have active resident associations. And, you know, you, you got to get involved because, you know, none of this stuff works if it, if it isn't coming, right. you know, from the constituents. And one of the things that has been forgotten to a large degree in Washington, D.C., is that the government works for the people. People don't work for the government. And, uh, but how can you really work for the people if you don't know what the people are saying? And, you know, that gives me my little segue to the media. Um, the media, the press is the only, it is the only business protected by the United States Constitution. Why? Because they are supposed to inform the people so that the government can then operate by the will of the people. Uh, when the press decides that they have an obligation to manipulate people, it changes the way that this country was designed. So I always appeal particularly to young press people, uh, you have an enormous responsibility to be objective and to tell the truth because it really does improve our country when that happens. I, I want to congratulate you on the concept of the Envision Center and, and the whole notion of, of being able to get um, uh, disparate uh, government agencies as well as um, nonprofits and, and other organizations together uh, to, to really get the kind of collaboration that's needed. And many of us around this table are involved in a number of those kinds of activities locally. One of the things that um, I, I, I uh, have seen over time, though, is that it's very important, I think, to have sort of a quarterback of a team to make sure it, and this picks up on a lot of the questions people have about sustainability mm -hmm. uh, going forward. And I guess my question is um, whether uh, HUD is going to be sort of that quarterback that kind of helps make sure that all of the collaboration uh, and coordination that you uh, want the Envision Center to do, is, 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 it, is, is, the, is HUD going to be that quarterback or is there some idea of, of how uh, an entity yes. or, or staffing would help us make sure that after we leave this table, there's still going to be a lot of that coordination. Good coordination. question. Uh, HUD will uh, have a core of people who are dedicated to Envision Centers around the country. Each one of the regional administrators also uh, plays a significant part in that, but each Envision Center will have a local leader, and HUD will be a support for that local leader the regional administrator will be a support for that local leader. Dr. Carson, you also talked about uh, self-sufficiency and people uh, going into business for themselves. Would you expound on that a little bit? Well, we, we, we obviously uh, recognize that there, there's an entrepreneurial spirit. There always has been. Uh, and a lot of the underprivileged communities, uh, what they don't have is the support it's necessary in order to make that first step. Uh, that's the kind of thing that we want to provide. We want information is as valuable as money. And a lot of people in our society do not have information. They have no idea what's available. They have no idea what steps to take in order to create a business and to move to the next level. Those those are the kinds of things that are going to be provided. I'd like to let you know in City of Fort Worth we have a business assistance center. Mr. Stearns is the person that's over it, and I'm quite sure we have a great connectivity there because we as a chamber and others are all housed as a one-stop shop, and so we're ready to do business. And, you know, we, I say collectively, we, uh, the government, we want people to be successful. They they have to be successful. It's the only way that our country can be successful. And uh, right now, we have a lot of things going on that are unsustainable uh, into the future. For instance, if we continue to accumulate debt at the rate that we're accumulating it right now, by the year 2048, every penny the government takes in will go to pay service on the debt. There'll be no money for any programs, 
no money for the military. We will be dead in the water. That's only 30 years from now, and that's assuming the interest rates remain low. So I, I can guarantee you there are a number of countries that have gone bankrupt. It affects everybody. It's a disaster. And they knew 30 years ahead of time they were going there, and they didn't do anything. And, and that's why I emphasize, emphasize it is possible to be both compassionate and fiscally responsible, and that's what we have to do. And on that note, <laughs> I want to thank the secretary for coming to Fort Worth. I want to thank all of the community leaders, the residents, for coming and giving us your feedback. We are committed to making sure that this not only is a success, but that we're working with each of you. Because without all of these partnerships, um, we will not be able to succeed. So thank you very much behalf on the uh, housing and urban development. And have a fantastic day. And congratulations on being chosen as one of the 17 in the country. All right. And thank you. All right.